So, to answer the first question that everyone has, why bullies of all things? They're the hardest darn things to identify, and there's really two reasons, for me anyway. First, they are the safest group you can find in our area. The worst that can happen to you in the Pittsburgh area, if you don't eat something that's rotten, is it'll taste really, really bad. That's the worst. Or it'll taste glorious or good. Um, there are bullies that make people sick. California's full of them. Europe has a bunch of them. We really don't. Um, the, there is one bad boy genus, Rubro boletus. Uh, that's the one that people watch out for. We have a Rubro boletus in the area that I have never been able to find. I've been looking for 10 years. I have not found it. It's that rare. And if you find it, it'll be, you know, red. It smells fruity. It has, it's a weird junk mushroom. When you look at it, and go, what is this thing? And you'll find out it's not reported to be toxic, but it's a Rubro boletus, so we avoid it because of that. Um, so that's answer number one. If you are a pot hunter and you're looking for good food, bull eats are your place to start. Second reason, um, Dick Dougal, who everybody here who knew him just sighed and went, oh, Dick. Dick Dougal was former president, life member of this club. One of the finer human beings you are ever going to meet and a very good identifier. And he hated bull eats. He said, they're all friggin' earth color. They're the same. The spore prints are the same. They're, you got to know, well, what color is the, the netting and the cap? And he said, the worst thing is, bullies do read the books. They're just, have, they're sadistic. <laughs> they know what, you, what they're supposed to be, and then they look at you, and they thumb you, and ah! <laughs> so the bullies are a cosmic pain in the butt to get to species. They're really quite easy to get to edible and good or one of these three. And that's what fascinates me so much about them. Um, we don't have an order for these, so we're going to go through them as they go. This is a good example, though. This is the oak-loving Boletus edulis, called Boletus variipes. Um, we found a bunch yesterday. And you see, this is the tail up here. Um, Bill Yule, who bull eat Bill Yule, is one of the best identifiers in the country. Bull eats are his specialty. He gave a talk here a few years ago where he said that bull eats are like card players. He said, they're really hard to read unless you know their tell. And they've all got their own little tell. The tell on Barry Ipes is the white netting. When you see something here growing under oak with this abundant bright white netting, it's Boletus variipes. There's a couple little variations. It could be Atkinsonii, which could theoretically be another species. I don't care, and neither should you. It's going to be delicious. Now, what's the trick with this? If that's brown netting, which we'll get to later, you'll have Boletus phellius. I'm sorry, Tylopolis phellius. Phellius is the bitter bully, the bane of all visiting Europeans. Um, we were talking about it downstairs. Do you remember in high school, we used to, there was one class where they'd give you the strip of paper, and 10% of the class would go, it's a piece of paper, and the other 90% would start spitting and retching, going, oh my god, kid. There is a particular gene, RS something, something, something. I looked it up the other day. If you possess that gene, you taste this category of bitter, and it, okay. Um, it is really profoundly bitter and unpleasant. If you don't have that gene, you just don't taste it. So the bitter bullets that we all watch out for, for maybe 10, 15% of the population, they're delicious. They're not toxic. They're just bitter. And if you can't taste the bitter, go for it. Um, if you serve it to someone else, they will hate you. Uh, and, and one of them, one, one bitter bully will ruin an entire eight-pound pot roast. They are, I mean, truly, really, 
bitter unless you don't taste it. The difference is they have dark netting. This is white netting. That's what you look for. If you find a little tiny miniature baby with white netting, make sure to taste it because Tylopus felius is a, is a sadistic SOB. And when it's a baby, it has, it has and it's still forming its white uh, pore layer, you can get little tiny hints of white netting. So when little tiny ones, make sure to taste them. That's number one. Boletus variipes. Find it, jump up and down, you win. Uh, the true Boletus edulis, the porcini, the steinpilz, the sep, the man, the mushroom. In Czech, it's just trib, the mushroom, <laughs> the one. Uh, we get them a lot here. They grow under Norway spruce. Norway, there's three different spruce. There's blue spruce. You got nothing. They're everywhere. You get nothing. There's an American Eastern spruce that sort of dangles down. And then there's Norway spruce that dangles down in big, heavy clumps of dangly spruceness. Long uh, tubes. Maybe one out of every 15 or 20 mature Norway spruce will have mushrooms. Um, if you find a big stand of them, watch it. They come out in uh, May, June for a brief season. You can find a few of them. They come out right now in large numbers. Over the last week at my favorite spot, which is within single digit miles of this location, uh, I have filled uh, five dehydrators and I now have about two gallons of dried Boletus edulis, which will last me for the year. Um, but if you find the right spot, that's what will happen. And you just got to watch for them. Uh, it's as summer turns, they come out a week or two. We all found a lot of them on the way up to Cook's Forest. People would stop at the different spruce stands, and there's a lot on the way. And they were there passing through, a lot of older ones. Okay. This is very common in the area. One of the easiest IDs you're ever going to make if you know the tell. If you don't know the tell, you'll never get it. That's it, right there. You see that strange color? The strange blue, gray, green on the pores? That's a mark of the genus Imlaria. Imlaria has two species. It has Imlaria pallida, looks like this, and it has Imlaria badia. Badia grows in duff under conifers. We found some at Cook's Forest. Pallida grows in oak. Loves parks. Loves Allegheny County. Um, that color is your tell. Sometimes it takes a little while. When they get a little dry, it may take it a minute or two for the, that color to come up, but that's what it is. Uh, if you wait five or six hours, it'll turn brown, but who cares? Look for that gray-green. Remember that strange blade? You know, it's not blue. It's a blue-gray-green thing. White over sort of pale yellow. Imlaria pallida, they're delicious. Yes, ma'am? Just back of the knife. I, I open. There it is. I make lines typically because they're, they're there and my initials have curves. So it's uh, for a prime fresh specimen, it happens immediately. But when you take the knife off, you can see it. If it's a drier specimen, it can take up to a minute or two. Again, they're very good at it. Badia is even better than Pallida, but they're both really good. Yes, sir? Um, there was a mycologist named Imler, Herr Imler, and the genus was named after Mr. Imler. Um, it used to be called Boletus pallidus. It's now in Laria pallida because Latin, you have to change the, the species. Thank heavens we didn't get worse than that. Okay. This is another semi-common one in the area here. This is Oreo boletus oriporus. You see the sunny yellow pores? 
There's, there's almost nothing like them. There, uh, we have two of them. We have Inixus and we have this one up here. When you see brilliant yellow, you look at it and go, whoa! Start thinking Oreo Bolitas, sun yellow. This one, um, the two tells for this are it has a slimy cap that tastes sour. Um, viscid cap. Problem is the cap will dry out. And if the cap dries out and you taste for the sour, you got to kind of taste for it. So it's, it's a confirming feature a lot of the times. It also typically, this is a typical stem shape for it. Long and thin, it's sort of um, naked, uh, you know, a naked color to it. Um, often they'll have a little bit of red down at the bottom. Another good edible, they're a small mushroom. You find them under oak. They're very common around here. That brilliant yellow, nothing stains, and you're there. Inixus, its little cousin, is is a good edible if you can stand the stink as you drive it home in the car. My wife can't. If I drive uh, Inix, a, a, bath, you know, a bunch of Inixus home in the basket, she will get a headache the next day from sitting in the car. Um, it's a smell that's very hard to describe. Uh, if you're on like the Facebook bullies page, you see us trying to describe it for the Southerners, and they never, chemical, some people say witch hazel. The closest we've come is, um, you know the clear plastic packaging tape you get where you open it and you get that whiff and you use it on your cardboard to seal? That smell, that chemical thing that gets in the back of your head, mix that with mushroom and you'll get Oreo bolitas in excess. Um, it's a good edible, and we've eaten it. It's just the smell of it is enough to drive you nutty. Does it smell like that on the yeah, it disappears. Um, but not if my wife has been in the house for you to get it to the stove in order to cook it. Um, that typically has a brown stipe. They're shorter. They often grow in big clusters. Um, so they're shorter and stouter than their uh, more elegant cousins. We may have a photo here. Yeah, there. This is Inixus here. You can, you can actually see how they're related. That beautiful sort of uh, bowling pin shape, the sunny yellow pores. These grow in a cluster. If you smell this one, when he's Walt Sturgeon, you see him hold everything up to his nose, first thing. That's one of the reasons why. It's a flat out tell. There's another one. Aureo Boletus, A-U-R-E-O, Boletus. That, that sour is um, Auriporus, A-U-R-I-P-O-R-U-S. Now, this is the one that nobody has any excuse for not identifying on their own. It is, this is the easiest identifier. I have some maybe chicken mushrooms. That's the easiest species that there is around here. Um, there is only one thing you need to do if you find it, and that's call Barbara Batakova, who has never seen them in situ, and insists she come over with her camera so she can take pictures of them. In situ, and by number 20, she'll start telling people to stop. Um, this is, the, the genus for this is in dispute. The, the, the genus is in dispute. There are people fighting about the genus. Um, it has a cousin to the south called Floridanus that also has the, you know, the big ragged uh, reticulation on the side, pores that are yellow tubes that, that, that are red uh, and grows little droplets when they're fresh and young. They were given, the, the two of them were given the genus Exudoporus. Then somebody did a pretty well documented paper at, that put them in with the butter bullies, Butyri bolitis. But now there's pushback because they're just different. Um, the, the, John and Richard are sitting here. The, the butter bolites have a, have a texture. That's one of their tells. They're, they're meaty, solid, beautiful, thick mushrooms. Um, there's sort of thing that you pick up, you get a butyri bolitis in your hand and you get mushroom greed because they're just like that. And these are not that way. These get a little airy on the inside. They're, they're nice. 
I believe they're a close relative. Whether it's Exudoporus or Buteriboletus is going to be shifting as people fight about it over the years. You don't care. It's frosty eye. It's, uh, in Spanish, they call it the sour belly bully. The viscid cap tastes sour. Um, when they're young, they get the ex exudation, the little droplets in the pores. Red pores bruise blue instantly, dark blue. The reticulations are raised. Uh, you, you run, it's not your fingernail. You run your finger over them. It's bumpity, 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 bumpity. Uh, the colors can vary. This one was all red. Often they're red with yellow. Sometimes they're yellow with red. They're, they're pretty variable that way. But it's the easiest ID you can possibly have. Completely edible. Uh, some people adore them. Some people dislike them. They have a sour flavor that's pretty distinct. Um, now, a lot of you, if you cook mushrooms, you'll, you, you saute your mushrooms, you'll finish them with a squeeze of lemon. These are pre-lemoned. Uh, and the people who tend to dislike them, when you say they're pre-lemoned, they go, oh, I never thought of it that way. That makes them a lot more palatable to a lot of people. Um, we can go into red pores and blue staining later if, if you want. There's a new article up at the Belit Filter site that I wrote to get rid of this. The bad boy uh, genus, the rubroboletes, happen to have red pores that bruise blue. They also happen to have a chemical in them called bolasati that affects your digestive system. It makes you vomit explosively. Bolasatine is the problem. Red and blue, completely unrelated to edibility. Okay, um, there's a whole chemical uh, procedure that's been studied. All the red bullets out there, and there are a lot of them, it's because of oxidation of orga certain or series of organic acids that oxidize red. None of them cause you any harm. Red is not a bad sign. They bruise blue because there are certain enzymes that buffer, and I'm not sure if that's the right, I'm not a chemist. They buffer the reaction, so when you oxidize those acids in the presence of those enzymes, you get a blue reaction. Not a problem. When you break the pores or you break the flesh, you are releasing both at the same time. Hence, you get blue instead of red. Not a problem. It is coincidence, not causation. Now, if you are in California or other places where you get Satan's bully, then it's a safe thing to say, well, red pores stains blue. The devil is blushing blue. I, I'm ignorant and I'm not going to mess with it. Okay. We don't have them. And it is, it's coincidence, not causation. End of my tirade. That's the blue. Blue-black. They're the exception. Okay. This is a subtle one, but you need to know it if you live around here, because this is one of our best choice edibles. This is Belita separates. Uh, it's a <laughs> see, it's it's another um, of our uh, oak loving true Boletus. It's a relative of your true Porcini. They are subtle. Okay, if you look, you see the the sort of pinkish, vague lilac in there. It's called the lilac Bolete, but it's a vague lilac. It's one of those ones where once you learn it, you will remember it, but until you learn it, the books don't describe it in a way that's really possible to understand. They almost always have these really seriously crinkled caps. That's a good tell. They're white when they're young. You see how here, those little spots, those open spots, that's not damage. The true edulous group has what they call stuffing that grows over the pores. The pores are actually, um, think of a bunch of straws. Uh, most mushrooms have gills, and the spores come out of the gills. The bolites are a group, they have little straws, tubes, that go down. The pores are the, the ends of the straws. So little round circles all mashed up together, pores. With this group, there is a white cottony stuff that covers them when they're babies. 
and the, the white cottony stuff breaks away and uh, reveals the pores. So here, those little holes, that's where the white cotton is beginning to break away. And you can't see any little dots in there because they're not visible. They're covered up. Right out here, you can see it's beginning to thin out and you're starting to see a little bit of pores. That's a sign of true boletus. Um, there are, I'm told, some exceptions around the country that also have uh, the, the stuffing on it. But if we find it, jump up and down, you found the good guy. Uh, I'm, Oropes is a non boletus that has stuffing. I don't know, I've never met them. It's out of my knowledge group. Uh, Bill Yule mentioned it on the internet, and so I, I went, oh, really? Um, the pores age yellower, or the tubes age yellower. My big tell for these, uh, everyone, everywhere you read, you'll, you'll see this sort of lilac y orange color, corrugated cap, lilac stem. They have a really unusual flesh in the stem in here. If you pull them out, it'll tend to crumble in your hand. It's like a styrofoam. Um, sometimes that's bugs, but it's also just loose and hard at the same time. So let that stick in the back of your head. When you cut them, and you go, what's going on with this? I'm getting little crumbles coming out of it. That's actually a tell that'll help you be confirmed that you have Boletus separans. Great edible. Um, Pine Ridge Park out in Laurel Highlands, right season, you can fill cars with them. Um, there is only one spot in this park that I know of that has separans, and I'm not telling you where it is, um, but they should be here. They're, they're a midsummer species. Yes? It's pinkish. It's a, yeah. Yeah, a pinkish lilac y thing. It's sort of the same color as what's on the stipe, but much, much more so. And colors in bolites are, uh, can be fleeting. If they grow up underneath leaves, um, we get the, the one that everybody knows, the big giant red one up above the pool here. That's Lanmaua pallido rosea. And if you notice, sometimes they're brown on top, and sometimes they're really red. Uh, it's a cold red, but it's like a, a cold brick red. It's because they're very sensitive. And if they get full sunlight, they change. If they grow up under leaves, they change. Uh, it's, it's an identifying characteristic, but not a reliable one. This cap color is useful, but it's not utterly reliable. They will shift. OK, by colors. Um, that which maddens. There is um, red, oxidized organic acid, yellow pores, really thin pore layer. OK. Um, here's what I can tell you about. There are about a dozen different species that look more or less like, they, like this. Uh, they're very, very hard to, to separate out. They are all good to great as edibles, with one exception, and nobody can identify it. Um, the, the North American boletes and boletes of Eastern North America, the Beset books, which are the Bibles, it's Beset, Rudy, and Beset. That's Bill Rudy, who lived in, lives in West Virginia and is now mostly retired. Um, Walt Sturgeon, who was here yesterday, and our own John Flischke, we're very good friends with Bill. Bill loved these things, and he has been quoted many times as saying every five years he gets sick from, from uh, eating bicolors. He has no idea why, but it's always bicolors. It's like once every five or six years, it'll just be a bad one, and he'll get it. If Bill Rudy can't figure out that it's not a bicolor, neither can you and I. Okay. There is a crypto species buried in, in the bicolor group that is a, a sick maker and will give you a bad night. Um, that Pine Ridge Park has a bunch of them. We know people who get sick there. 
uh, I am, you know, one of my missions in life is to try and get some proper PhD to, to do the study on the bicolor group so we can get them identified. But if you're going to be eating bicolors, just assume once every five or six years, you'll have a bad night and you'll be vomiting. It's not, it's not like, you know, Satan's bully where you're vomiting your guts out and you regret that you're alive. Um, but it's like you, you had a drink and a half too many and it's un distinctly unpleasant, but, uh, you know, say la vie. Other than that, in these groups, you're there. Uh, the big one we have up there is Landmaua pallido rosea. When they're small, they look just like this. Um, we get uh, Landmaua pseudo sensibilis, which has a couple of really subtle little tells. And, you know, the seniors here can tell you what it is. Don't bother trying until you care. Um, we get actual bicolor. We get a bunch of other yellow and red ones. They're all good, except for that one mystery species that I can't identify for it. Yes, sir. And, and true bicolor, and in all the land mawas, the tube layer is very thin. The tube layer. Um, so if you get one that has longer tubes, you know it's not uh, an actual Bauerangia bicolor or Land Maua species. But uh, this is meant to be sort of a field identification primer for people. And trying to get into the distinctions of the red and yellow bolis uh, is master level stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay. On Boletus pseudosensibilis, they stain blue brilliantly, very quickly. After 15 or 20 minutes, the blue turns to a very distinctive uh, red-brown, burnt sienna. Good edible, that's its tell. On um, Landmaua Paula rosea, no, they don't really brew blue except when they feel like it, which they do every once in a while, when fresh, and there's been recent rainfall, and they just decide they want to screw with you. Baurangia bicolor, they blew reliably. They often have a curry smell to them, but not always. Um, Boletus sensibilis looks just like this. The tubes grow longer. It's probably a land mawa. It stains blue on the tubes instantly and profoundly. It stayed blue on the inside instantly and profoundly. People are eating it now and enjoying it. Um, Gary said he, in the last year of his life, he had been eating it and enjoying it. Started to give him his digestive system. Decided didn't like it after all. Uh, so with regret, he gave it up. But uh, they're all very hard to tell apart. And for this class, we're just going to call them red and yellows and move on. Be happy to go over them later. OK. One of the most common bullets in our area, this is Lexinellum, not Lexinum, Lexinellum albellum. They grow everywhere. If you find something in oak, long, skinny stem, skinny stem, that goes up to um, sort of a soft, puffy white cap, especially with deep tubes. If you look up here, see how deep that is, where it depresses over by the stem? It's going to be albella. It's perfectly good edible. Often the stem, the stipe, is too stringy to bother with. Uh, but it's one where you can be very knowledgeable. What uh, Taste of what? It actually it gets a little marshmallowy too. Um, Lexinum is the genus that has all the big scabering on it, the, the raised bits and pieces that aren't quite netting. This is Lexinellum. Uh, so it's closely related. If you go to Hartwood Acres, they're friggin' everywhere. Um, and they're very common here. They're in the woods. For, for whatever reason, I don't find them in, in the clearings. I only find them in the deep woods. But uh, it's good to know that they're wonderful dried. Put them in the, the mix with all your other mixed bolets with your Bob Key and you're good. Okay, this is an actual Lexinum. I'm glad it's up here just to show the difference. See how the scabering goes all the way up? It's a stout stem. Lexinums are an indecipherable pain in the 
butt to get the species. Um, you can usually get them down to five or six. The ones that are salt and pepper with white caps and white pores like this, we usually call this uh, snelli eye or scabrum. Honestly, I have uh, I, I need books to get down beyond. Okay, lexinum, salt and pepper white. If you're pot hunting, you don't need to know more. They're all good. They're all there. Um, but it does demonstrate the difference between lexinum and lexinellum. Um, they can have skinnier stipes, the one on the left. But in the center, it's a little bit depressed. It's not profoundly depressed. And uh, as I say, it's perfectly good edible. Is there anyone who can't identify that? Okay. Um, the only question with Old Man of the Woods is how edible you think it is. Opinions differ. Uh, in conditions, they differ. My advice is they make a wonderful mushroom salt. And uh, there are genetically several different species. People used to have different tricks to identify them. Those tricks have since been debunked. You can't. You can't tell Strobilomyces, uh, Strobiliform, whatever the names are, Strobilaceous from uh, the other ones. Point to, it used to be, look at how the, the, the flakes on the, tap, uh, on the top, are they pointed or are they flaky or whatever. You can't tell. It doesn't work genetically. They all taste the same. You get to Strobilomyces and you move on unless you want to be a mycologist. And if you really want to be a mycologist, you start looking under microscopes because I believe you can tell from the spores. But um, for field, for this class, for field identification, I don't care. Old man of the woods. How many different species are there? Three. Three. Two that are more common and one that was recently erected and I don't know why. Okay. I have inside information on these. Um, a friend of mine named Igor Safanov has done the research. He drives uh, at, at the very top levels of mycology, in, uh, especially amateur mycology in this country. He drives people crazy because he won't publish. <laughs> he won't publish the damn information, but he shares it. So I can tell you what these are and how they work. Um, if you are from Europe, you'll look at this and go, oh, that's uh, Loritiformis, also known as Erythropus or discolor. All the European ones got merged together. The genus is Neobolitis. It got disappeared for a while. It's back. The genus is Neobolitis. This is your red mouth bolete, your Scarlatina. That's the common name we've been trying to use. It's the common name they use in Europe. These are excellent edibles. Cook them thoroughly. That's the, the advice that comes down. Um, apparently, they can cause some GI distress if you don't cook them enough. There are three of them in the Northeast. One of them grows with conifers and actually has little red hairs down at the bottom. That is the actual Neobolitis subvaluteopes, about, um, about to be published with, uh, as an epitype. It grows, as far as we know, only with conifers. It loves hemlock. It gets along OK with a couple of other ones. If it grows with oak, there are two species. There's this one that Igor likes to call chameleonensis as a holding name. It's not the real name. He made it up just for discussion, okay? It's probably going to end up being subleridellus, but we need to test the, the, um, the species from Smith and Thiers at the, our bear, at the University of Michigan, and we haven't got the money out yet to test them properly in order to confirm that they are the same. This is what you're finding. Yes? Uh, Subvelutipes. S-U-B-V-E-L-U-T-I-P-E-S. It was listed in all the old field guides as an avoid um, because it had red pores and stained blue. Um, it, is, it is not a rubrobolitis. They have all sorts of netting all over them. They're very distinctive if you look them up. The problem with this species is it's it is a chameleon. It, this can be a red stipe. 
It can be a yellow stipe. It can be a mix of the two. It can be brown, it can be yellow, it can be red on top. All you know is it's going to bruise like crazy when you find it. It's smooth, it's a red mouth, it's a scarlatina. Cook them well and they're delicious. But one second. The other oak-loving species that we, have, that we find is more rare. That one has an, a dark, almost, you know, a real dark brown cap, often a little velvety. It's another scarlatina. Igor has another name that he gave it. I won't get people up, on film upset about mentioning his holding name. We don't. Uh, we used to call that one Luridiformis in America. Eventually, this will get ironed out. I am told on the slide that there are a, a couple of other ones from the Midwest that are unpublished uh, that, that may be out there. So the Neobolitas group is going, but it's simple. If you find scarlatinas, be happy. They're good edibles. Cook them well. Getting them to species is a pain. There aren't that many. The literature is all fouled up. And the man who knows the answers won't publish. So that's more or less the doctrine. Did, you, did, Richard, did you have something you wanted to add? or No. Sir, did you have a question or did I answer it? I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, that's a cap. Same species. All of these were found together at my neighbor George's yard. Um, and... They're, uh, they're very common. In fact, they're so common that Barbara and I went out yesterday and we were talking about them. She said, oh, I miss the scarlatinas. We can eat those in Europe. I said, oh, we have those. And we drove to the spot above the pool, the, um, the deer browse shelters above the pool. You get them right there. They grow like mad as, you, as you're entering. Um, and why do I share a spot for a good edible mushroom? Because they grow like mad. <laughs> I mean, they're so common that, that they're not worth bothering with. Yes? Yes. Um, oh, that's, thank you. You just reminded me. By far the biggest sin with the bullies is greed. Look, there's three evil Gs to, to mushroom picking. There's ignorance, arrogance, and greed. Those are what get you in trouble. If you are ignorant, don't pick it. I'm ignorant about Amanitas. I avoid them. Okay? If you are arrogant, you say, oh, I know that. I don't need to... <laughs> Those areas that John was talking about yesterday that will kill you dead, 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 I, you know what? I can pretty much tell most of my courts I don't mess with those without books and spore prints and other things to be very, very careful. Otherwise, I'd be being arrogant and I would be dangerous. Greed with bullies happens all the time. There is an infection, my, hypomyces, the white stuff you get on top of your bullets. It's a mold. It's another fungus. By, hypomyces is incredibly invasive. Okay? You can't see all of it. I don't believe, well, maybe the hypomyces itself is toxic too, but the fact is, once you've got the hypomyces infection on your bullet, it's the mushroom's bad, it's like you've got your chicken and there's a little spot of green fuzz. And I'll just, I'll just cut off the green fuzz. It's chicken. I love chicken. Don't do that. I mean, don't do that. Eating rotten mushrooms will make you sick. Imagine that. And people with bullies all the time, they say, oh, they're so good. I'll just cut it away. No, there's more of them. Don't be greedy. Um, if you get sick because you ate a rotten mushroom, don't blame the mushroom. It was your, your G did it to you. Okay. This one you're finding right now. Suillus americanus. With, <laughs> with Gary Linkoff, may he be remembered for many, many more years, called the chicken fat mushroom. They grow under white pine, nothing but white pine. They're chicken fat mushrooms because they feel like that. They're slimy on top um, and sticky. The grass sticks to them. They're, they're real pain to clean off. Um, they are good edible. There are people, uh, if you cook them raw, they taste like okra. They feel like okra. Okay? If you like okra, you may like them. 
but they are slimy. If you dehydrate them, it deactivates the slime. That's my, by far my favorite use. I dehydrate them all when I find them. Uh, make a duke cells. You know, you chop mushrooms with shallots, cook them up. Just use button mushrooms and reinforce it with a handful of dried um, swillis, and your mushroom duke cells will become mushroom duke cells. It's a really good cooking trick. Uh, some people, if you want to eat them fresh, most people say try and peel off the skin. The skin will come off. It turns your fingers brown. It sticks to everything. It's more trouble than it's worth. And if you just dry the darn things, it deactivates the slime, so who cares? But uh, they're very common. And if you see white pine nowadays, this time of year, you're, you're going to find these. Um, <coughs> Bright yellow cap, bits of red. This is absolutely typical for them. Um, when you find them, if you think it was uh, Americanus, but it's dry, wet your finger, rub it along the top, it will get slimy all over again. You go, ha, I'm smart. Uh, no, because it dries out. It's a, uh, there was a piece of grass as it was growing, and, and the red formed there. Uh, again, red in bolides comes from oxidation factors. So as they're maturing, you're getting, with the, the environmental features, you're getting effects on the internal chemistry. Um, it's like people have red, some people have red spots on their faces that don't go away. We just call them freckles. Sometimes the freckles are brown. Uh, oh well. Okay, this is the other most common swillis to know. Slimy on top, um, white. This is the artist formerly known as Granulatus. Uh, we have been robbed and cheated. It's no fair. Four letter word, four letter word, four letter word, the scientist that did it to us, okay? Granulatus is a European name. It's the best name you can, I mean look, granules, it's a swillis, big pores, that open up as it matures, slimy on top, grows with, uh, with white pine. It, they have a sort of unusual odor, the whole genus does, that you learn to associate. Granules all the way up at the top, granulatus, I've got it. It's now Suillus weaverae, because granulatus is a European species, and somebody decided to compliment their good friend, Mr. Weaver, who I'm sure deserved it, but now we're stuck with weavere as the Latin name, and it helps nobody. So we are going to call the artist formerly known as Granulatus. Um, and if you say that, all your, your senior mushroom friends will nod sagely and go, you're smart. Yeah, there it is. Um, some of us have even been arguing it should be Granulatus variation Americanus or sub whatever the word is just because Granulatus is such a good name. And they're identical to the friggin' European ones. Um, again, white pine, uh, you'll find them there. They often grow directly with the Suillus Americanus. Perfectly good edible, much better dried. This one's better than Americanus fresh. That's not saying much. Okay, do you remember the first one we looked at? Variipes, that lovely white netting, jump up and down for joy. Lovely brown netting. You save this to, to teach people why you have to taste your mushroom fine. This is T. phellius, Talopolis phellius, the bitter bully, the enemy of all visiting Europeans. Um, who, who They see these beautiful, solid, looks like edulous bully. They go, these Americans don't know nothing. And then they taste it. Nothing you can do. You can't, you can't convince them. You say, here, taste it. And they do the ugly dance. They spit. They do all the rest of it. Um, I, I'm making a joke out of the bitterness. Um, if it's dried, sometimes you can't taste it. Uh, it gets worse if you cook it. But I will tell you, I, I have a friend um, who's a you know, five-star chef. The guy is absolutely as good a chef as there is 
anywhere. And he's from the Philippines originally, where he grew up eating bitter melons. So we were telling him about these bitter bullies, and uh, he said, well, I like bitter. You Americans, you don't like bitter. You don't know from bitter. I want to try one. So we were out in the woods, and he tried one. And it, it was, we still pick on him to this day and tell the story. You know, the, it was hilarious. They are bitter. That little bugger sitting in my hand here, I'm, I'm not kidding when I say that will ruin a pot roast. All on its own, irredeemable, irretrievable, gone. If you can't taste it, God bless you. Um, Arlene and Alan Bissett have a friend, they say, who can't taste the bitter, and who cooks these up like they were his favorite mushroom in the world. Says they're ab absolutely delicious, and I believe it. God bless you if you're one of them. Okay. Plumbio violation. This is another bitter Tilopolis. See the purple? Sometimes, it, I have this one because sometimes they have brown caps. If you walk above the pool, um, you can find a lot of bullets in those different shelters. And there's one shelter where these grow purple over purple. They're the most sensational, solid, meaty, desirable mushroom you'll ever pick up. They're inedibly bitter. Um, sometimes worse than Phalaeus, they, they vary more. But, and I don't know if any of you are, are mixologists, you know, you love playing with liquors, this makes a particularly good culinary bitter. Um, you mix it with the right herbs, you do the magic that's needed, you sous vide it for safety, and you will make, I've had some, I have a friend down in South Carolina who makes them out of different bitter bullies, and they're good. They're really good. He says Phelius doesn't work because Phelius is a evil, sadistic, nasty person. But these are only bitter unless you find the right use for them, which would be culinary bitters. So if somebody is into that kind of thing, I do encourage you to try. Um, I had a brief arrangement with uh, Wiggle. They were going to experiment with it and I was going to find them a bunch of Plumbio violaceous last year, and then we had drought. Uh, and I didn't find a lot this year either. But when they come out, they tend to come out copiously. And um, if you're a photographer, look for them. They're fabulous to photograph. Oh, my God. They're, they're, they're like glamour children. You know, the people who, who turn and smile in just that way? They, these do that. They're, they're, I mean, look at this. What, could, what more could you ask? Looking down, again, the purple is distinctive. When I say they're purple, they really are. And these are not purple for that species. Okay. Very common in summer around here. And the only way I can tell you to identify these, you see the dime? They're not big. This is Xanthaconium purpurium, I think. Uh, there's two of them. Xanthaconium purpurium has purple in the cap. Xanthaconium affini has brown in the cap. They often have spots or they don't. I have trouble, personally, telling when they have enough purple to be purpurium. I can get to Xanthaconium. They're a choice edible. The best tip I can give you on this is um, a, a joke my wife made. You see, they're, they're sort of white pores that age yellow, sort of like Boletus. They're very, this one's not buggy because it's a baby. You see the stem, the stipe? Them, them Xanthaconian girls shave their legs. And they got razor burn sometimes. If you look at this, it's, remember, it's a joke, but it's true. They have these smooth, nothing raised, sort of fleshy stems. Sometimes they're darker, sometimes they're lighter. Um, that's, when you look at one, you go, this is a nice little mushroom. I wonder what it is. It's all smooth and, oh, 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 oh. Them xanthaconium girls shave their leg. Then you start looking. The poor, the tubes will get yellower in age. Um, they're very firm. They often get a little bit of that same styrofoamy thing in the stipe. Uh, the problem is that bugs love them. It's a constant race. 
See if you can get them before the, the bug holes happen. If you can, dry them out, they're a choice. Dink, dink. No move. How do I hit? Oh. Ah. Is that the last one? Yep, okay. So we've gone through them. These are all uh, common mushrooms in our area. And that was the goal of this. It's, um, there's a lot of different bullies. They're a pain to get to species. Easy to get to edible. Taste them. It's not, I mean, I was out there yesterday. You all saw me being a, a jerk with the, the edulis in one hand and the, and the phellius in the other hand. Tasting the mushrooms is an important ID characteristic. You've got a mobile chemical sensory lab with you. Two of them. You can smell them and you can taste them. You cannot get hurt with a spit and taste, uh, a taste and spit test. Um, Richard and I were talking about this yesterday uh, with Fluff and I think somebody else. Even if you have an Amanita, you know, you get a, a destroying angel and you taste it and you spit it, um, as I understand it, and, you, and Richard can correct me, the, the chemical that kills you in that gets into your liver and prevents uh, cell division. So you end up with gangrene of the liver and your liver dissolves after a week. That's what kills you with those amanitas. If you have only the little tiny remnant in your spit from chewing spit, you might lose 10, 15 cells. It's not enough that your liver is going to have a problem. Okay? Taste and spit is safe. Taste and spit is vital to identifying, especially with the bullies, and especially in our area. We don't have sick makers, but we are loaded with bitters. And that's what you're looking for. So, when in doubt, taste. Any uh, questions? You all going to let me run to the Steelers game? What's... Yes, sir. Um, you said like in our area, how far do you have to go to get things that you uh, mentioned? Oh, okay. Um, well, California, the West Coast, to get the big rubrobolitis. Uh, rubrobolitis, um, roto, what's it, roto, it, it, it has roto in it, like rhododendron, um, but I forget the exact name. It's common in Ohio. Um, if you go down around Cincinnati area, they find it commonly. It's common in, um, in Ontario, I'm told. So, uh, and John told me once he found it at, um, uh, what's the big, the big park that, that people go um, uh, rafting down? Um, Ohio Pile. He found it at Ohio Pile. Um, well, it grows. It grows with oak. Uh, it's called the perfume bully. This is its nickname. Apparently, it smells fruity and perfumey, especially when you dry it. It's uh, if we had the bully filter up, you can look it up. There's a lot of photos of it. Uh, it. As I said, it's not known to be a potent sick maker. It may not have bolisatine in it, but it's it, you know it's from a cousin of. It's a close cousin, same genus as the really bad boys. So that's the one to avoid. We also have one called Eximius, um, the violet gray bolete, which is dark. Um, has a, like a dark gray um, stipe. And that's known to make, uh, a lot of people are sensitive to that. It used to be considered an edible. Then it became a beware of, and then it turned out to be individual sensitivities that people have. Um, if you find a weird one, then, then you, you go double check. But it's just, in general, we don't have the issues. The Hiranensis is the one everyone worries about. Um, I used to worry about it a lot more. Boletus Hiranensis is known to be a, a pretty violent sick maker. There are some uh, articles that were written on it where people got hallucinations because they were so 
so ill. But it's a really unique species. Um, when you hold it in your hand, you'll never forget it. It's hard. It's almost like you're tapping a piece of wood um, or rubber. Someone called it hard rubber. It grows only with hemlock. And it's, uh, it's real stomping ground is um, Quebec and Maine, and it spreads out from there. And, you know, maybe you can get it along the, the Great Lakes Ridge, but you find it with mature hemlock, and it, it has confused people at forays you know, uh, because it looks very edulous-like, but once you meet it, once you know it, you won't confuse it because of that texture and generally. I've never seen it. I don't, it's not actually been reported by the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club, even from Cook's Forest, where they have a bunch of hemlock. So we are in its theoretical stomping grounds, but nowhere else. And that's pretty much the... Uh, that's all the bad boys I can think of in our area. Yes? Uh, yes. But the belief filter is basically my notes. It, uh, what I did when I wrote that was um, I went to those glorious books by, the, by BRB, Bissett, Rooney, Bissett, and I drained all the data and rewrote every sentence because so, I'm not going to steal copyright from anybody. And then I take notes. As people tell me things, I learn new things, I put the notes in. Uh, two days ago, when, up at Cook's Forest, I learned from John and Walt uh, Zeracomus, which is the um, Eludens 10x. It, uh, for those of you who know, it's the ones with the, the big giant netting on the stem. Turns out there's an even more reliable tell I'd never heard of. They, have a, they go down and grow underground to a root, to, to a, a really point, and the point at the very bottom is hard, like a wooden nugget. Not hard like a bully, you know, where, where it can be firm, but hard like you could pinch it and hurt your finger kind of hard. Wow, I never knew that. It'll be in the bolete filter by the end of the week, I promise you, as, as an extra tell. So that's what it is. But um, the bolete filter was designed, and I keep telling people, it's a key. It's not an identifier. When you get to six or so, look them up. It was designed to be used in conjunction with the books because uh, the paper key at the front of all our, our books is a technology artifact. The technology that Linnaeus had was he had to scroll on a piece of parchment. And if you want to go through the identification process, Linnaeus didn't need anybody to tell him what it was. He knew it. He looked at it and was, oh, that's Beangelus. He knew it. But in order to teach people, he had to say, well, here's kind of the, what I'm going through when I'm thinking this. And it's a le level of steps. In reality, the identification is a gestalt. It's knowledge. So Alan Bissett, who's a brilliant identifier, he doesn't go through the process. He looks at it and goes, oh, that's little Jill. I know her. And then he has to explain it to other people how he knows it. Plischke is just like this. Plischke knows all these mushrooms. Oh, that's Bill, that's Jin, that, that's Joe, that's Al. He just knows them. But then he has to try and explain it to people when it's hard. Keys are the only way you can do that to explain to people on paper. The bolete filter is a key that comes from any direction. So, I mean, the most useful thing you can do with a, um, with a bow is probably look at the stem. And that's, I think, where the beset key starts is with stem features. If you've got a broken stem, you're, you're up the creek. Well, you know, this, you can say, well, my stem's bad. I'll look at all the other features and narrow it down to six, and then I can look them up and see maybe what I've got. Um, they're not entirely reliable. Our region, southwest Pennsylvania. Oh, there's Eximius. Can you scroll down? There's your, your other one. And Luridus, Suelelus Luridus, is really a southern mushroom. We, uh, people, my friends would find that a lot. But it's, um, that may be edible. That's one that was tainted by red porous stains blue. And we don't know. It was described as inedible 
in all the old literature, so I can't change it until I know better. Um, there it is. Rubro bolitis roto sanguinius. Perfume bolit. You may run across that one. We don't know that's bad, but it's a rubro bolitis, so I'm, I'm not going to be the one to test it. Uh, but the regions, I just found one that I'm pretty sure is new to our area. Um, the ashtray bolit. Uh, oh, God. Yeah, I'm, well, it smells really bad. It, it has an odd smell. What? It's uh, Lex, Hemilexinum, um, something with an R. Uh, it, it's not been recorded by the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club, so it's not on the filter. But I found one that I'm pretty sure is what that's what it is. I couldn't find it again and, and confirm it, so maybe next year. But we'll find out. Uh, oh, up it's up at the, the spot where we find the gigantic Palo Rosia, up above the pool in the second loop, the, the ones that can go over your head like an umbrella. Uh, it was growing right there in that patch. Wrinkly cap, brown, hemi, you know, little tiny scavers, and had a really sort of unpleasant smell. That, yeah, it might have been ashtray, but we have to confirm that. So the regional filters are good, but they won't catch your exceptions. If you find one that, that you're just not happy with, change from southwest Pennsylvania to Pennsylvania, or from Pennsylvania to northeast. And you just spread your pool out and find more. They're not political creatures, they're just sadistic. So they don't obey state lines. Um, we do, which is why we use them. Uh, but it's a key. It's meant to get you close. Sorry for lecturing. People who tell me that I, I didn't identify it properly using the belief filter, and I just tear out what's left of my hair because you're not supposed to. Um, nothing will ever replace knowledge. That's your goal in all of this. You want to be... Alan or John or Richard or other people who look at it and go, oh, that's this one? And then they have to explain to you what it is. That's knowledge. The books, the keys, the other stuff, the myco cards that Gary Gilbert did, for which I'm so grateful, um, those are tools to help you learn. Yeah. Or, yes? Yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be commercial. Um, the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club hosts the Belit Filter and actually pays a decent amount of money for the hosting space because it's now getting hundreds of thousands of hits every month in summer. Uh, so it gets slow and when we do updates it occasionally crashes and burns and so forth. Um, there will be an app. I have it on my phone. I have the beta testing app on my phone. Um, we're, it'll be out in the next couple of months, I would guess. Um, right now, we could put it out with advertising, but we can't put it out where you can buy out from the advertising. So the developers are trying to fix that. If you want to do the database for any other group, you want to do an Amanita filter, the club is eager to host it. And people are eager to help. I have two, 3,000 hours of writing in this. That's the hurdle. Anybody who wants to put in two, 3,000 hours of writing can, can key out all the Amanitas and get them written up. The club will love to host it. I have no claim. That, that's part of the deal. If you want to write up the Amanita filter app, I'll give you the app developers. I have no claim. You work with them and you split with them. They have the architecture already written and waiting for you. So um, consider that an invitation to anybody who gets obsessive-compulsive about a particular group of mushrooms. Uh, yield are harder because you and I look at it and go, oh, that's a Russula, or maybe it's a Lactarius. Let me check. And, oh, that's an Amanita. Explain that to somebody brand new. They both got white gills. Oh, oh and that's a Leucocoprinus, and oh, that's a, a Lepiota. 
<sighs> Dick Dougal used to give that talk, and it was it was hilarious. Um, you know his his fear of lepiota. Um, so you, you'd have to figure out a way to divide everything up to get them identified, but it's there. It's waiting to be done by whoever it is that's obsessive compulsive enough to put in the time and do it. And so, yes, you can find it through the um, Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club. Easy enough. You can just look up Belief Filter on Google. It'll bring you there. Uh, and there will be an app available in the near future that will earn me small end money. <laughs> Anyone else have questions or particular bullies that bother them? And ask me about anything but bicolors. I don't want to do that to y'all. Oh. There you go. That's the description. There you go. Yeah. Look, it's it's an amateur. Yeah. Bottom line, we are we have one of the best mushroom websites out there, the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club. It's maintained by people who are volunteering, and if you know, I, Richard spends. Richard is is your computer geek genius at your big corporation, okay? And if we had to hire him as an independent consultant, the club would have been bankrupt many, many years ago. Um, and it drives him crazy maintaining all of this stuff. We are desperately lucky to have um, a website that works as well as it does. And we're not pros. So, you know. Yeah. The, right. right. And this is actually WordPress. What this is is um, a program called WooCommerce on WordPress. And it's the program you use if you want to open a shop to sell t-shirts and you wanted to have, behold, um, long sleeve shirts, short sleeve shirts, under short sleeve, there's red, blue, yellow, green, um, shirts with pictures, shirts with tie-dye, pants, you know, it's a shopping website. It's a kludge. Of, um, you take something meant for one thing and you twist it and use it for another thing. And it, it was the quickest way of converting it into a website that didn't involve custom software. Right. But the filters are a partic one particular, not app, what do you, they call them, plug-in. It's Facet WP. Right? Yeah. yeah, right. So um, all these different features on here come from particular plugins. If you use Word, uh, WordPress, you, you can buy, or, or usually they're free, little plugins that go in, and they update them every so often. And they tell you, Compatibility 100%. I don't hit update unless it says 100%, but it's 99 point something percent. And with the amount of traffic we got and the complexity, we occasionally hit the, uh, the fraction of a percent where there's a problem. 